Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our event, Shaking EU Solidarity in the Western Balkans, few from Albania, Kosovo, and North Macedonia. My name is Johannes Pollock. I'm a professor of political science and rector of Webster Vienna Private University. And together with my colleagues, Michael Keding and Paul from DTEP, from TEPSA, we are the editors of uh, a recent book, which we wish you would all have in your hands already, but unfortunately, due to a change of editors, it's taking a little bit more time on EU solidarity. I'm very happy today to discuss this book with this specific focus on the Western Balkans with three experts today. Uh, I welcome, first of all, Donika Emini. Donika is a PhD candidate in politics and international relations at the University of Westminster in London, very close to one of my favorite restaurants in London, I have to say. Uh, she is uh, an extremely active scholar and activist, I have to say. You lead the Civicos uh, platform uh, of more than 260 civil society organizations in Kosovo. You hold a master degree in public uh, policy, specializing in nonprofit and, and public management, as well as international uh, relations. Your background is also security studies. You worked at the Kosovo Center for that, and you were a research uh, fellow at the EU Institute for Security Studies in Paris. There's a lot of others, but I, I keep it relatively short. Uh, Donika, thank you for joining us. Our second speaker today is Alphonse Rakai. Alphonse is based in Tirana and a project manager. And uh, he is a researcher for the leading think tanks in Albania for international, but also national non-governmental organizations. Uh, you're currently working for the Institute for Political Studies in Albania. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see that you are focusing on the same stuff I am focusing on. That's governance issues, democratization, EU integration, but also Albania's uh, foreign uh, policy. You hold a BA in political science from Oregon State University, as well as an MA from the prestigious King's College in London and MA in international affairs. So thanks to you also for taking the time and joining us today. Irina Rachinovska bandeva is an associate professor in political science at Justinianus Primus Law Faculty at the Cyril and Methodos University in Skopje. The name alone, I think, stands for Europe. It's a, a wonderful name for a university, I think. You're also vice dean, and you're reminded in your function as vice dean, we have to look a little bit at the time too, for science and international cooperation of the faculty. And of course, you're also a TEPSA board member. Welcome uh, to you too. Now, when we started devising the book uh, on solidarity in the European Union, of course, we could not foresee at that time how much the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, would be a kind of real-time laboratory to see how European solidarity works out in, in real time, so to say. Is it correct that, as some say, the European Union is just a fair weather union, and as soon as there's bad weather, we will return to nation-state politics? It certainly looked like that at the very beginning of the pandemic with uh, shutdowns, uh, of the borders between the member states. Give you an example, the Germans suddenly decided to stop exports of medical goods. The integrated European market allowed the West of Austria, for instance, to receive all those goods, also logistically, directly from Germany. That stopped overnight. And we have many instances across the European Union where uh, the free movement, etc., but also the free shipment of goods was put out of order basically overnight, a return of this kind of national thinking, which for some people, including me, was actually devastating. Devastating in terms of thinking that we have overcome this past of the nation state and have realized the insight that Europe can only work if it is working together, if the member states uh, work together. Now, this, this kind of early pessimism, which is also a little bit reflected region-wise in our book, think about Northern Italy, for instance, made room later also for the amazing uh, political declaration of will and confidence in Europe with the 
reconstruction and resilience pact that we have said, said see, the unique effort of Europe uh, not only to strengthen those sectors that have been hit very, very hard during the pandemic, but also it is a kind, and I don't know if you agree with that, it is a kind of strategic reorientation of the European Union. It ties into the Green Deal of the von der Leyen Commission. We will see of all the plans that the member states had to hand in last month, if we see that reflected, that this is an opportunity according to the Chinese uh, proverb, never let a good crisis go to waste. Will Europe find the strength, okay, to come out of this crisis together? Certainly, I guess you will agree, uh, the recent years, actually beginning with the financial crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, then the pandemic, then the Brexit, it looked a little bit like a perfect storm for the European Union. It looked like this is now the time by all those efforts of uh, mostly right-wing uh, politicians and parties in Europe come to fruition. We see a slight breaking up of the seams between those member states. I, for my part, was astonished how easily some of these seams broke. Think about Brexit. Um, might be euphemism to call the divorce easy, but nevertheless, it worked in the end. I was astonished to see that. And secondly, also what I've mentioned before and due to the pandemic, okay, where long established practices suddenly were abolished uh, overnight. Yeah, I remind you, the crisis is not over, but already last year we saw certain glimpses of hope, not, not so much in the vaccination programs where we have huge regional disparities, which I think... Uh, need to be tackled very, very soon. Think about the, especially the Balkan areas where the European Union needs to put much more effort in these vaccination programs. But we have also seen some bubbles. The Baltic bubble was one example of solidarity and action amongst those countries where mutual help uh, was uh, granted. Whereas on the other side, the book also shows a couple of sobering facts that we have more trust in Russia, the Russian government and the Chinese government, who used this crisis perfectly in terms of public relations. Uh, it's amazing if you read in the book that uh, for a certain period in time, there was more trust in the Chinese government that delivered broken, but nevertheless delivered some medical equipment to Northern Italy, then into the European Union. I mean, this is a catastrophic, I think, uh, fact that needs to be tackled. Now, if the huge reconstruction and resilience pack will also restart this thinking of solidarity remains to be seen. It remains also to be seen how much the European finally starts thinking about connecting to its citizens. All of you, of course, know about the Tindemans plan. That's a couple of years ago where it said we need to kind of find a better way to communicate to citizens. I, for my part, have not seen that these efforts have come to any fruition, not in the past 20 years at least. So we have the danger that on the one hand, we have a reconstruction and resilience pact that could kickstart a kind of new European economy in a lot of sectors. On the other hand, we have the failure to connect to the citizens at a more I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it personal level, but to connect to the citizens, so to say, to get the enthusiasm for the European integration project back. It is kind of difficult to kickstart this trust in the European Union again. I'll give you just ex one example. Look at the youth unemployment across Europe. It's, uh, it's uh, it, it, one of the biggest problems the European Union has. From my perspective, look at what we have seen with the uh, migration crisis. We still have no solution here. And look what's going on uh, with the undermining of European values that we see basically uh, on a daily basis nowadays. Now, this is the kind of short background I wanted to chart. Chart, don't, for, uh, chart, don't forget the, the book is just a snapshot. It's always what it is. Books of this series also want to provide one quick snapshot. And of course, we have seen lots of developments. Now, I'm looking forward to hear about those uh, developments uh, from you, from your specific region, and would invite you to give your initial statements. Donica, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thanks, Johannes. It's a pleasure to uh, be here among experts, and it's uh, it's uh, also uh, a true pleasure to have had the opportunity to give my uh, uh, modest contribution to to this book. I mean, when it started last year, it was definitely different circumstances. Uh, but the pandemic is still not over. Uh, I have decided to uh, to uh, uh, call my uh, chapter "Friends in Need" or "Friends Indeed," not because I love the song, but also uh, in addition to that, it's because I, we really realize how hard it is to navigate in times of crisis, unprecedented crisis through which uh, Kosovo was going. Uh, if you look, I mean, uh, when you look at the solidarity issue, then you know, we, I, I decided in the chapter to look at it from two perspectives, from the one that is from the regional perspective in which the EU uh, has played and the solidarity that the EU has shown towards Kosovo and the region, but also uh, the uh, internal dimension, which I'm sure all the, also other authors will touch upon, which is how the governments navigated and the lack of solidarity of our own governments towards uh, towards us, the citizens of, of the region. Uh, I uh, um, intentionally said uh, that the pandemic is not over because now we are dealing with what is known the biggest crisis to, to uh, um, uh, and, and that's, you know, ensuring vaccinations for our, our citizens. And that's, that's where geopolitics comes to play. I mean, in the beginning, it was the tests and then it was the medi medical equipment. Uh, and now the vaccine geopolitics which is very much present in the Balkans. I mean, look at, look at the EU and how uh, how embarrassing for the EU is, for instance, to be receiving or uh, to have Czech Republic uh, receiving vaccines from Vucic, you know, from Serbia. And not just because it's Serbia, it's because it's coming from a uh, semi-authoritarian regime, which has been uh, navigating quite badly in the past year, on, on uh, especially on uh, in relation to China and Russia. You mentioned rightly so. Uh, I think uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, China became quite relevant in the region. Not that it wasn't because it was present to many economic infrastructure projects, uh, but I think being closer to the citizens, it was exactly the pandemic and, and the way China in a way penetrated, not just in Serbia, but also other countries in the region. Uh, I think only Kosovo so far is the only country that hasn't received any Russian or Chinese vaccines, apart from those that were given by Serbia in the northern part of Kosovo. Uh, but uh, we, we decided to stick to um, the Western vaccines. Uh, and uh, this was also the, the, the reason why our uh, Prime Minister Kurti actually rejected assistance from Albania and for Rama because it was you know, the Chinese vaccines that Rama was giving to Kosovo. Uh, so when you look at this, you know it's about geopolitics. It was it was never about it. It was never about uh, the 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 health uh, in in uh, particularly. Uh, going back to 2020, when uh, I, as I recall, I mean I have survived the war, but you know like 2020 was a really depressing and uncertain uh, uh, time, which cannot be uh, compared to to uh, what happened in the 90s in Yugoslavia. But we got the feeling. We got the feeling of having having closed borders. We, we got the feeling of not being uh, uh, sure whether you know, we're going to have food for a certain period of time because all of a sudden, even you know, Serbia and other countries in the region decided not to uh, export flour to, to, to uh, each other, you know, just like that, simple as that. And not talking about medicine, uh, talking about uh, food. Um, and uh, I think in this regard, uh, what, you know, it's really not mentioned that much in, in the public is the fact that the EU has done an immense job to actually ensure the, that the green corridor stays open. Uh, that immediately when the pandemic actually started and we quarantined, the EU with a regional uh, cooperation council has worked proactively to ensure that at least the Green Corridor would be uh, open and that uh, the essential products will still be uh, 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 there for the citizens of the Balkans. The second one is that uh, not much heralded, but uh, at least in Kosovo, the EU has been the biggest, uh, uh, the quite fast in responding to crisis, which is not 
something to be expected by the EU, given the fact that usually, you know, the bureaucracy and the decision making process uh, takes forever. Uh, in this regard, the EU has been one of the first one to not just donate uh, money directly, but also to invest in medical equipment and tests. Uh, and that's something that, you know, even it's incomparable even to the uh, to the uh, actual assistance provided by the US in Kosovo, which was uh, which was not comparable uh, to that of the EU. And then immediately the EU started talking about the economic recovery, you know, knowing that what's going to happen and what is uh, uh, coming up uh, is going to be uh, having a detrimental impact in already a devastated um, economies of the region. So then the EU, in a way, has been quite fast in responding in this regard. But that's only the case of Kosovo, because uh, uh, this uh, uh, cannot probably be the case with other countries in the region. Uh, and here I specifically uh, uh, talk about Serbia. Well, you know, there was a lot of expectations from from outside to actually from external actors to be to show solidarity in Kosovo to uh, promptly react to uh, to the crisis. What happened in Kosovo was unprecedented. Uh, and here comes the second part of of my uh, of of my chapter, which talks about. Um, how governments failed uh, to deliver for the citizens when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in 2020, I mean, uh, in a time span of less than two years, Kosovo changed four governments. And this sp speaks volumes about the political crisis and lack of political stability internally. So for a citizen of Kosovo who was dealing with a pandemic, which had a detrimental impact on the healthcare system, which was underdeveloped and prone to corruption in the past 20 years. And then of course, there was the uh, devastated economy, the, of course, the social pressure and, and uh, uh, dealing, while dealing with this uh, uncertainty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we have gone through unprecedented Unprecedented crisis, and uh, um, we are probably one of the first governments uh, to actually to actually uh, the countries to overthrow the government in uh, the first 10 days of the uh, pandemic. Uh, a recently elected uh, Kurti government, Kurti first uh, government, because now we have the second, basically was overthrown uh, 10 days uh, after uh, the country went into full quarantine. Uh, this gave, gave the citizens immense insecurity, uh, but also uh, created um, immense obstacles to uh, for the state to actually react to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it took us six months to actually have an anti-COVID law, which, act, which regulated how, literally for us how to behave uh, during the pandemic. And it took us more than a year to actually launch the emergent, uh, economic emergency packages, which were symbolic and were cut immediately uh, because then there was another change in the government and we then went through new elections. All of this during the pandemic while people were dealing with the crisis alone. So when it comes to friends in need and friends indeed, the government was not our friend. Uh, the uh, um, crisis management in Kosovo was a waterfall system. Basically, we were either lucky or like to some extent, or uh, which is not something that uh, uh, an, in an academic event someone would say, uh, but really we're lucky because uh, the population of Kosovo is rather young um, because, uh, and the effects of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic were not as detrimental as in other countries, uh, but uh, we still don't know the exact number of victims. We we still don't know how many people were uh, went through COVID uh, or who had COVID. We are still trying to find out the exact numbers because we never had the test to actually uh, uh, find out the real number of infections. Uh, and now we are still dealing with, uh, uh, with, with struggling to get uh, vaccines. I think less than 1% of the population is vaccinated and we are just receiving so far we have received only uh, uh, the vaccines part of the COVAX scheme and it was yesterday that for the first time the government was actually able to purchase vaccines and uh, we received the first contingent of Pfizer. Uh, so 
yes, we are still dealing with a crisis. We're still not sure the exact uh, impact on the economy and the government is still not ready to take off uh, uh, from here and, and intervene by uh, uh, through uh, multi, multi uh, million uh, packages which are very much needed uh, to uh, at least go back to normal. And we are not talking about economic uh, uh, um, development anymore. We're just going, going talking about the struggle to go back to this, uh, the, the situation before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, being still is isolated, what's uh, I think an ended on a positive note is the fact that um, countries in the region, when they decided to open the borders, they applied reciprocity with each other. And uh, uh, we started in a way, uh, opened the, the, the borders and started traveling to each other's countries. And we, in a way, were more inward looking, unable to uh, to travel to other countries like EU countries, because as a third national, that's very problematic. Uh, I think uh, the uh, inward looking tourism has been booming and probably Alphonse will cover this. I see Albania being one of the hotspots. I see people going to Serbia instead of Greece to Albania, which then hopefully uh, in a way will help us know each other better, explore each other better and create more people to people communication when it comes to uh, the citizens in the region. Monica, many, many thanks also for this uh enthusiastic pledge at the end for better understanding and also understanding the region better. Uh, Alphonse, I'm handing immediately over to you one year of accession negotiations in Albania, plus the pandemic, not an easy situation. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Johannes. Uh, thank you, all of you. It's a real pleasure being here with you today. Um, as Donika noted earlier, the, the timing of the drafting of, um, of these chapters um, corresponds with a given time where um, in between then and now a lot has happened. Uh, yet some things still remain uh, quite the same. Uh, the EU continues to be Albania's principal investor, donor, and trading partner. Um, and in spite of what happened in between all the rising uh, criticism towards the EU, uh, these have not changed, in fact, if only they have consolidated further. Uh, the crisis in itself, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, really exa exacerbated a lot of the existing issues with governance at, at the local level. Uh, we had to uh, go into a state where we're all dependent on the government. Um, quite strongly before, we tried to rely on ourselves, the government sort of being there in the paradigm where you are best when you don't have to deal with institutions because they're too much work, too much stress, and a lot of times too expensive. Um, but then all of a sudden we had uh, to all isolate in Albania. It was uh, quite an immediate reaction following the emerging news from Italy. We were extremely isolated, especially in the big cities. Uh, we had tanks on the streets kind of demonstrate in the force of the government, they're taking charge. And even for, uh, for a short period, we had this sort of peaceful coexistence among political parties, which are usually um, uh, at loggerheads with each other. And, and they all seemed to, to make a little more sense. People turned towards each other. But then as this um, crisis continued, the isolation remained, a lot of questions started being asked. How do we continue governing? How do we continue living? How do you continue working with each other and in retrospect with other countries? And Albania as a small country on the, uh, surrounded by EU countries and, and quite strongly depending on trade and interaction with the EU countries, uh, really strongly felt that. And uh, it, it just was a moment of realization of how important EU was and how important relations with the EU were, um, the moment all this sort of ability to, to uh, purchase uh, medical equipment uh, from EU was stopped and taken away. And in a very symbolic uh, moment, there was a day when uh, Turkey sent in a plane with uh, medical equipment and masks that, we, that were being purchased in Greece were stopped at the border. And this sort of created the perception that the EU has really left us alone. And uh, from there on, it continued with the prime minister really taking a stronger stance 
um, that the EU has really just blocked us for political reasons and sort of a little bit with um, in tune with Vucic's uh, criticism. He has continued that uh, throughout and um, coming to this day, we see a lot more of it. Um, although in, in the meantime, it must be reminded that in the March of 2020, Albania was formally allowed to uh, open negotiations with the EU. Uh, the solidarity that the EU had shown just previously with the earthquake uh, uh, disaster, it was really unprecedented. It was uh, at the, the highest proportions and, and the most unexpected manner. Um, and this, to me, uh, is really reflective of the perceptions that have been created of the EU. Um, and in Albania, there is three significant uh, perceptions, almost perverse, if you will, that have been created due to EU's uh, consistent uh, solidarity with Albania. Um, and the first one is that uh, Brussels' unwavering solidarity has created a perception that the EU will always be there to uh, lend a helping hand in difficult times. We saw this as Albania during the 90s, we saw it through every disaster, um, through from the earthquake to the pandemic and so on. Uh, it has also contributed to a perception that Albania is both a reliable and a useful partner to the EU concerning Albania's um, uh, compliance with EU foreign policy on sanctions, say with Russia, although it was not economically viable for Albania actually, as it started uh, picking up on trade with Russia, and then all of a sudden it had to, to stop it uh, to comply with, with the EU's foreign policy. And this kind of takes place with a lot of other things, Albania being among the first to really um, allow the unprecedented uh, justice reform, the massive uh, uh, constitutional changes, and, and sort of giving almost a, a carte blanche, if you will, from the local perception to you to uh, interfere in local politics or uh, determine outcomes. Uh, the country has also increasingly been increasingly dependent on crucial assistance from the EU, and this is the third perception. Um, and this is something that uh, when you combine them together, these effects could impede on, so on local solutions and generate unrealistic expectations. Um, the expectation being that the EU will always kind of take care of our local affairs, that will contribute to building us better infrastructure, better roads and so on. And in some ways, um, we kind of tend to hold the EU a lot more accountable for their actions rather than the local government. And, and this is problematic, although not unjustifiable in the sense in, if you look at Albania's EU integration path. Um, and coming to that, this has the prolongment of uh, the first IGC and the approval of the negotiations framework, the opening of uh, negotiations has contributed to this sense of um, it's really out of our hands. The process is completely not based on merit anymore. It's just a fully uh, political one. And it has given a, a really useful card to the government because they can, they can vindicate themselves from all the responsibility. And this is really where um, it becomes more problematic, uh, this relationship. Uh, nonetheless, it, it must be noted that um, even in recent, uh, in recent uh, surveys conducted by the uh, RCC, um, Albania is among the, the highest ranking, second only to Kosovo, who uh, in perception, Albanian citizens saw the EU's contribution during the pandemic as, as being uh, very strong. Uh, so for Albania, in that case is the European Union, 50%, Russia to China to uh, Turkey, 29, and then um, another 15% or so said that they were uh, uninformed on the issue. Uh, but this still goes to show that in spite of the, the hiccups, the hurdles faced, uh, the increased criticism uh, by the government towards the EU, uh, Albanians continue to, to look very favorably upon the EU, uh, continue to, to look at it as sort of a, a way of saving ourselves from the uh, prob problems that our governments uh, bring upon us. And that is poor governance, lack of accountability and transparency. Thank you so much, Alphonse, for this first 
report from Albania. I would also later be very interested to hear about how the horizontal relationships between your countries uh, worked out. If this uh, not only the pandemic, but is also the pandemic has strengthened cooperation, made cooperation mm -hmm. impossible, and also. And that's later be my last question. What are the lessons for the future, so to say, on a regional level, but also at the European level? Irina, views from North Macedonia. The floor is yours, please. Well, thank you. I would first like to thank the editors of, on the edition of the work uh, on the, their work on the edition on Future of Europe book series. And of course, the text of the Secretariat uh, for uh, organizing this event. Well, without any doubt, the question of solidarity between the Western Balkans and the EU is undergoing a fundamental review. As uh, Bankrov has recently underlined, any top down top on solidarity on the part of the EU will these days uh, be uh, met with considerable cynicism. And I would point out that any grassroots discussion on EU solidarity towards the Western Balkan is equally met by inflated Euroscepticism. The reasons for these notions, of course, go back to the other uh, compounded uh, issues that are settled low or high on the agenda of both respective sides. And in order to justify this uh, standpoint, I will make use of the Macedonian uh, example. Now, two developments in the past months have uh, affected the existing uh, setting with regards to North Macedonia and would have for sure changed the tone of the text that was originally submitted by myself and Professor Gergievsky if we were to write it uh, uh, now, today. One or the first one is related to the relapse of the optimistic prognosis related to the Macedonian success on its EU accession in 2020. <clears throat> and the second one is related to the whole context of the assistance and support coming from EU aimed at handling the pandemic in light of 2021. Yet despite all of it, we must emphasize that we have found ourselves in a not much different uh, paradigm than let's say a year or years ago. Uh, I will explain. But the current state of affairs on the North Macedonian file, simply put, is a stalemate. Or, and I have used this metaphor a few days ago in a similar debate on Western Balkan enlargement. If we are to pronounce it in a more vivid way, it probably uh, looks like or resembles a daily routine of a hamster in a wheel. Now, regarding the stalled EU progress and related uh, regional conundrum, um, as you all know, 17 years have passed since North Macedonia applied for accession from a front runner, it became a laggard, and 2020 was actually supposed to be the year of success for North Macedonia in terms of reaching its Euro-Atlantic goals. In late March 2020, North Macedonia became a full NATO member and EU opened its door along with Albania by reaching the decision uh, to launch the accession uh, of two both countries. But conversely, it did not include a specific date for the accession talks, and at the same time, it included a novel enlargement strategy and was coupled with the Commission's plan for the region. By the end of 2020, Bulgaria vetoed the decision to open talks with North Macedonia, a move which indirectly also affected Albania as part of the tandem. And despite the signing of the bilateral agreements in, in uh, bilateral agreement in 2017, and the mechanism of dialogue and cooperation that is provided by it, Bulgaria chose to block the accession. So Bulgaria has objections, keeps highlighting additional notions, which to outsiders may seem trivial and benign, but I can assure you they're not. And its position is increasingly entrenched in spite of, uh, in spite of the mounting pressure to entangle the uh, in, uh, enlargement process. The past few years have been difficult for the region and North Macedonia particularly due to the pandemic, but most substantially because there is a sense that the EU policy towards the region and North Macedonia in particular since the fiasco of October 2019, the absence of success in 2020 and most probable debacle this year yet again is unprincipled or to put it bluntly unfair especially if we put it in correlation with the overall positive assessment of our progress 
but also with the major concessions related to the PRESPA agreement. The implications of the latter um, still do and will continue to affect us, notably since a large extent of the population rejects it, and a sizable segment of the political elites keep questioning it, yet most significantly for the reason that it was considered um, as a trade-off for EU accession, and it was promoted as such and backed by, openly backed as such, uh, by the EU itself. Now, if we are to uh, narrow uh, the EU policy down to its response to counter the pandemic and assist the recovery in the region and North Macedonia in particular, we would find an increase of Euroscepticism lately linked to the perception that the response was not enough and too late to make a difference. In our case, the, uh, the display is weighted by past complexities on our path towards EU, including the enlargement fatigue, uh, that I have mentioned um, uh, at the beginning, but also in line with the apparent reality that this path of ours towards you keeps getting more and more compromised than uh, it manifests as, as endless at this point. On the national front, uh, North Macedonia has made enormous concessions, has shown readiness and capacity to compromise and conduct tough reforms and uh, has shown uh, uh, and continues to work on reaffirming its dedication and preparedness to start accession talks, which has been praised and supported by the EU. However, the absence of a clear, uh, viable EU perspective is fairly responsible for the region's malice, and it has most undoubtedly produced a great level of Euroscepticism over time. However, what we really need to be concerned about is the future of the process itself and how do we counter the diminishing effect of this delay. Why? Because of the conventional wisdom that the region and North Macedonia will not become part of the Union anytime soon. Even if the accession talks are open now, we will most certainly see the end of the process in a decade or so. Uh, needless to say, the deadlock is overwhelming the Macedonian national discourse, but the context is much different than the one uh, three years ago when we had to deal with the implications of signing the Presta Agreement. Namely, um, North Macedonia has done everything that it was required to, and in some cases, even beyond that, uh, such as uh, in terms of uh, some reforms or adoption of the AKI, but also in advancing the EU uh, agenda at home. And um, the political leverage of our uh, current government is constantly questioned on many levels uh, in relations with EU and particularly with Bulgaria ranking on top. So the issue has a potential to produce another, another political crisis. The public support for uh, EU accession is lowering and it is thus creating a space for EU credibility to be undermined. And the political balance of inter-ethnic uh, relations is also delicate and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, therefore, in addition to the uh, fragile democracy, stout EU prospects, dealing with the pandemics, handling uh, constant migration flows, persistent brain uh, drain and assertiveness for uh, reforms, one has to praise the overall success of the country even despite its many, many problems. Now, concerning the EU solidarity in action, definitely uh, EU solidarity was and is visible as well as indispensable. However, again, it is tainted by uh, the EU's initial response towards the region in North Macedonia, which included closing of state borders, blocking of medical purchases, and keeping its um, uh, crisis recovery package to exclude non-member states. In 2020 and 2021, the assistance to North Macedonia from EU and its member states was mostly composed of financial means allocated to successfully fight the economic consequences of the pandemic. Also medical and sanitary equipment, there were offers to accept COVID patients and so forth. The EU response started rolling as early as uh, April 2020, and I will not bother you with the specific numbers and specific packages, uh, what I would like to point out that in addition to the union, assistance and support for North Macedonia came also beyond the, uh, the EU, including individual member states, 
such as the Czech Republic at the beginning, then Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, Austria, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and so forth, NATO allies, but also other countries who were willing to extend uh, assistance, such as uh, China, most notably, uh, Switzerland, Japan, and so forth. And though the lack of support from EU and North Macedonia uh, uh, is mostly visible in the supply of vaccines, and uh, this supply is uh, was and is uh, insufficient. So other players took upon the role of suppliers, most notably Serbia, providing several vaccines and options, but also uh, China. To sum up, the COVID-19 assistance provided by the EU was essential and also a continuation of previous uh, assistance and support. And to this date, uh, EU remains as the largest donor and leading supporter of democratic and economic reform and foremost computer, uh, contributor to, uh, to the country in terms of assistance uh, for recovery. If we are to combine these both developments that I've mentioned, the stalled progress in accession and solidarity in crisis, we would find that reaching out is not only about providing financial means or providing medical supplies, although this was very much true at the peak of the health crisis. Um, North Macedonia is actually a clear cut case in how solidarity can and may be reconsidered when put into a perspective of its relations with the union, because at the end, solidarity is not just about sharing material things, uh, but about inspiring and maintaining the notion of unity based on common uh, issues, shared values and joint prospects. And this is something that the EU clearly needs to work on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irina. Uh, thank you also for embedding things to all of you, embedding the question of how the European Union and its member states coped with the pandemic into the much larger picture of the Western Balkans and its integration into the European Union. As such, I think this was highly important. Now, next point on our agenda is, of course, contributions, questions, comments from our audience. I should mention that you can either do so by using the chat function or by just uh, raising the hand and together with Paul, we would then also forward those questions uh, to our panelists. Now, if there are no questions at this very moment, I would very much like to ask you a kind of provocative question, okay, which is in, in academia, just here to spruce up the discussion and to kickstart it. In your opinion, did, did the European Union fail? when it comes to the integration process of the Western Balkans. And I would start with Irina first, because I think I know what your answer is. Thank you. I just wanted to un unmute myself. I just noticed that I muted myself. Uh, well, yes, most certainly yes. At this point, uh, you know, uh, putting bilateral issues again on the table, because we are considering it as uh, putting bilateral issues again on the table, or I would make use of uh, Albanian uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Rama when he was here, I don't know, a few days ago, I don't know how many days ago, five days ago, six days ago. He said, uh, ironically, I hope that at the end of this process, you will not be named West Bulgaria because then you will have to negotiate with Greece again on the name issue. So at this point, the stage is occupied um, by uh, North Macedonia and Bulgaria, or Bulgaria and North Macedonia, as Albania is a collateral at this point. But at some point, other member states can put other bilateral things on the table and the stage can be occupied by the others. Um, I have mentioned this before, and I will mention it again. This Enlargement fatigue is really, really uh, taking over uh, the whole discourse because um, when we began uh, first answering the questionnaire and then beginning preparations for the uh, accession negotiations, we were young. I mean, there are now people who are uh, not just tired, they're retired. There has been a very long, uh, very long process. And I think that, as I put it, it's uh, it's unfair. That's the general, the general notion. 
Thank you, Irina. I have to remember that not just tired, but also retired. <laughs> uh, iPhones, is that by and large also the picture uh, for your perspective? Uh, it, the short answer is yes. And um, in, you have to measure the, the response to that question of, uh, from the objectives and the criteria that were established. And in that sense, yes, it's, it's a failure. Uh, but I would have to add that in Albania, the, the sense of disappointment is uh, not nearly as uh, strongly felt as in North Macedonia for obvious reasons. And, and you see this in the way uh, bilateral meetings uh, are reflected in the media. Uh, when an EU commissioner would have visited Tirana before, it was a, it was a massive uh, coverage you saw in every media covering all the details of every meeting with the political leaders in the country. And now it's kind of shifted uh, down to towards a secondary in importance almost uh, meeting. And we, we saw this um, uh, last time we had the, the commissioner for, for the neighborhood enlargement, uh, Varhali, visit Tirana. And um, this was in the framework of the, the vaccines that the EU was providing for Albania. And, and the meeting grabbed more attention because the, the, they held public speeches at the airport where a Turkish Airlines uh, uh, plane just uh, passed by. And that was the most attention it, it, it gathered rather than the actual meeting itself and the solidarity that it showed with providing around 154,000 uh, 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 vaccines. Thank you, Alphonse. Tonika. How is that scene in Kosovo? Does it even have a perspective? I mean, uh, you left me in the end on purpose, I think, because we are the laggard uh, alongside Bosnia. I mean, uh, we don't, we are not even sure whether the, um, I mean, uh, the EU integration process for Kosovo is uh, is going to take place. I mean, yes, we signed the SAA formally, so uh, Kosovo has contractual relations with the EU. Of course, immense job has been done, you know, on, on, on behalf of the EU to make this sign by sidelining the five non recognizers, which are the key problem for Kosovo. So it boils down to bilateral issues either way, whether it's in the region or outside of the region. But uh, it's, it's very hard when uh, uh, the, a country has a problem with an actual EU members because the EU has a lack of mechanisms or even leverage to actually pressure the member states. And when it comes to the problems in the region, Kosovo has issues with, with Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, we are in the process of, of uh, at least, you know, uh, trying to solve one dispute, which, which is with Serbia in order to pave the way then for, uh, for you know, basically, we're expecting to have a domino effect in a way that after we solve one, then the, the uh, path will be uh, uh, open for Kosovo, which is a trap in a way, because what is happening with North Macedonia now is highly discouraging. I mean, you, you one cannot say that, you know, what is happening in Macedonia is not impacting the other countries in the region. Uh, first is the, the lack of enlargement uh, uh, perspective. I mean, we don't know when it's gonna take place. If, um, North Macedonia and Albania are str struggling so much to have their accession negotiations open. We're not talking about membership. We're talking about, you know, just access of the EU to literally screen the country internally. Uh, uh, and, and still there is reluctancy. Imagine, you know, what was going to happen on the actual enlargement process. Uh, second is the change of methodology. I mean, learning by doing, that's, that's how the EU works, but it's really this methodology there because they are really keen to see, to see reforms in the Balkans or uh, they are more uh, creating more uh, political obstacles uh, for the countries uh, trying to uh, become part of the EU and obstacles, of course, coming from the EU member states, which, you know, in, in the case of Kosovo, that's going to be having a detrimental impact if, if other countries would do the same as Bulgaria is doing to North Macedonia. And third, What's the, it's the political leverage of the EU. I mean, I remember in the Blood Strategic Forum when Dacic from Serbia said like, oh, Macedonia changed its name 
and and got what in return? The host of the Berlin process, uh, you know, conjointly with Bulgaria, kind of making fun of what you know North Macedonia got in return. Um, the other element that is important in the case of Kosovo is visas. I mean, uh, it's not the first time that the EU is not delivering after after you know uh, a a process of of um, when when the countries actually uh, uh, fulfill uh, the uh, benchmarks. I mean, look at the visa issue for Kosovo. It's a technical process which in a way got highly politicized. And now we remain the only uh, country isolated in, in, uh, in Europe. And, you know, like, it's frustrating because there is Colombia that has, you know, a freedom of movement with the EU. There is Taiwan, so it's not an, a stated issue. I mean, it's just, you know, the way that the EU has, you know, over politicized the technical issue, which shouldn't be the case. So uh, many questions in Kosovo are like, uh, what's the point of us delivering in the process of dialogue with Serbia and making a huge sacrifice? Because of course, every agreement comes with a compromise and compromise means win, win, but also win, lose, lose. Uh, when, you know, the EU is not even ready to deliver on visas. I mean, just two, two weeks ago, Lajcek was asked about visas on Kosovo and his answer was like, well, if you don't like the EU, go somewhere else. Uh, well, I mean, we cannot go physically somewhere else. It's impossible. So the somewhere else will come to us, meaning that China, Russia and other you know, external actors are here. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, this arrogant approach, but also this uh, sort of uh, uh, EU attitude towards Western Balkans, like you have nowhere to go, or if you don't like us, then, you know, just stop being with us. It's kind of problematic because we are talking about 20 years of uh, of extensive investment, political, uh, also a lot of money has been poured in the region to be thrown away just like that. Um, so, I mean, in Kosovo, the EU uh, is being seen through the lens of visas, which is not positive at all. And then from the dialogue, which is again, you know, not positive given the differentiated approach of the EU towards Kosovo and Serbia, of course, but then also inability to, de to deliver when it comes to, to, to this process. Uh, so far, although, I mean, one thing that the political elites in Kosovo did not do was that they never uh, tried to flirt with other external actors, meaning that, you know, in spite of the EU being very complex in, in delivering, uh, there has not been like any attempt, to, you know, to even uh, negatively contribute to the narrative against the EU. Uh, if you look statistically, which bothers me a lot, 90% of Kosovo are very <laughs> pro-EU. Uh, and uh, if you look at the reality, uh, I mean, the EU is definitely delivering less in, in in Kosovo uh, in comparison to uh, to the other countries in the region. Uh, but still, uh, it's, it's still okay that uh, the, narr the positive attitude towards the EU is still here. And I really hope the EU will make good use out of it. I mean, the Gordian knot is the visas. And if the EU and member states do not realize this, then it's gonna be too late uh, 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 to, to fix this. Thank you, thank you, Donica. In the in the meantime, we also received one comment in the Q and A section. Unfortunately, it's from an anonymous attendee who reminds us uh, that it might well be that the European Union, and I have to say, I always mean more the member states than the uh, institutions in Brussels. That the European Union might have failed the Western Balkans in terms of vaccines or participation into the future of Europe and the lack of EU initiatives. But the question is also how far did the Western Balkan governments fail the European Union? Can it be that the EU fears a kind of authoritarian backlash, uh, something we see very, very well, and I also paraphrased this comment in Hungary and in Poland uh, today. And that's why, says the comment, why it is the European is not the European Union is not enforcing its normative power uh, too much. We can take up this question later in the other round or this comment if you see that there is some validity in it. Uh, I, for my part, can only uh, say that I'm very skeptical when it comes to the normative power uh, of the European as such, irrespective 
of uh, the issue of the Western Balkans. We also have one raised hands by Daniela Yasimovic. Uh, Paul, may I ask you to uh, open the mic for Daniela? Yes, she should be able to speak now. Yes. <coughs> Thank you very much. I don't know do you see me, but for sure you can hear me. Uh, I'm coming from the University of Montenegro, Faculty of Economics, and of course I always like to talk about economics aspects of all of it. Thank you for your nice presentation, but honestly, listening to all these Western Balkan arguments, you make me sick. The good thing is that <laughs> we have seaside and at the end of the day, I can go there and meditate and seize the day, but uh, you know, it's really, my stomach is really working. So I would like to raise one question because I, it seems to me that we are talking all time the time the same arguments and going back and forth. And I just have one question from Professor for Professor Falk. What do you think? Is it real uh, good strategy of EU uh, to address uh, political criteria as the most important set of criteria towards Western Balkan, especially in this post-COVID uh, era? I think that uh, last yesterday I read the study published from Italian Institute for International Affairs that all uh, neighboring country of Western Balkans, like Slovenia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, are receiving almost 10 times more money uh, per citizen than Western Balkan countries, and we are far below, and with this very, very, very modest economic condition, we should achieve the high, <coughs> high political standards. <coughs> Actually, I was shocked with the statement of my daughter that she spent last two years in the Germany. And when she came back this year in Montenegro, she debated all time standards of EU and standards of Montenegro. But she said one very simple uh, sentence saying that <coughs> if people in Western Balkan or Montenegro, we we'll have personal uh, net, the, at least some normal wage level. They wouldn't go to corruption. They wouldn't go to this and that. And and she just said, people in Germany they have enough, so they don't do that. So how do you really think that this is real prognosis, real approach of EU? Okay, fulfill political criteria and then come reach. Uh, healthy come to the EU. Is it possible or it, or it is just such a good argument to stand by a system uh, for all Western Balkan countries indicates that they'll come? Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniela. I hope I did understand you correctly. You were a bit difficult to uh, understand. Um, if, if I may start, and then I would also read out another comment, and then we can have a final round of your comments. Um, I, I, I do think that the opening of accession talks and the accession of whatever country into the European Union has an enormously stabilizing effect and is enormously important for the development of democracy in those states. We have seen that in Spain, we have seen that in Portugal, and so on and so forth. So I think the political criteria are important. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, no one doubts that really, but they are of course not the only criteria. We also know, we've seen that the big bang enlargement, you remember that the European Commission retained some rights of control in Romania and Bulgaria and the fight against corruption is still a major issue there. Imagine the following, imagine that after 10 years, we have an assessment of the Reconstruction and Resilience Pact, and we see that an enormous amount of money of this gigantic sum was squandered in the EU. That would be also a very, very huge problem. So those political criteria are enormously important. The question is, does the European Union do enough in order to support the the, the, so to say, the, the normative development that you find in those political criteria. Okay, that's a huge question. 
I gather from my, my fellow pan panelists that one of the big problems is the disappointment. Irina has said that the disappointment of years and years and years of investment of resources, not just money, intellectual resources, hopes for young people, okay, that Europe presented a kind of, I wouldn't call it beacon, it sounds a little bit too thick, but a kind of development path that you see ahead of, of you, that the European is increasingly failing to deliver. All of us here on the panel, all of you here in the audience can name multiple initiatives of the European Union, which sounded fantastic and came, came to nil, to nothing, okay? And you know, there is the point when you keep telling people, or if, you, if you're making promises and you fail to deliver, that people turn away and listen to others, be that Russia, be that China, be that the right-wingers, be that those people who think that democracy is, is not the right way out of the mess and so on and so forth. That's where I see the real danger. Now, before I hand over uh, to my fellow panelists for their also final statement, so to say, I have a question from uh, Alfonso Velasco in the chat. How do you value the recent, how do you value the recent veto of France towards North Macedonia uh, accession. My reminder was not only France, it was also the Netherlands. I think there was a kind of general feeling within a couple of states uh, that this would be not a good idea. I, from my perspective, I can only say that must have been perceived as a slap in the face, uh, given what has been done in those countries. And for me, it wouldn't be small wonder if those countries at one point say, look, if you don't want us, okay, maybe we think about our own regional integration and there might be a different hegemon and not Brussels uh, leading that. Uh, it might be a very bleak picture, but uh, history tells us a lot about that. So I would like to invite all of you for, for your statements. We have a little bit of time left so that Irina also reaches her hopefully not so boring meeting uh, in administrative matters that you have. Uh, and I would like to start in the same way as we did in the beginning. Uh, Donica, uh, the floor is yours again. Well, um, I totally understand. It makes us sick too. I mean, we are in the process since 2003. And since 2003, when formally the EU has launched, you know, the enlargement process towards Western Balkans, there is only one country that joined the EU. And the rest are still struggling, uh, going back and forth without a clear path towards integration. Um, political criteria is very important. What we did as civil society and what me and Irina here, because I mean, Albania is uh, an Alphonse is a bit luckier not having uh, a prominent bilateral dispute. They have a hidden one with Greece, which is kind of still uh, under the carpet. Uh, but uh, what, what we are tired of is the fact that uh, the EU with its stability approach has constantly put uh, prioritize the bilateral issues and solving bilateral issues uh, instead of uh, talking about reforms and criteria. Uh, just recently, citizens of Kosovo and Serbia have been asked, what's the, important, the most important process in the EU integration? And they said, the dialogue. We shouldn't be the case. It should be the reforms. It should be every chapter that is not the dialogue, that is not the chapter 35. It should be the lives of citizens and chapter 23 and 24, which is rule of law, fundamental first, right? I mean, this is what France wanted and that's why they vetoed uh, and they, they, they uh, opted for the change of methodology. Uh, this is the, the, um, the, uh, the political criteria is also important, but something that is being bypassed again by, by the EU, uh, unable to, to, well, fulfill, to, to, to be the normative power that they used to be. I mean, at least with the previous enlargement and successes in other regions. Uh, what, what I see now among the EU is this willingness to actually, uh, 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 
be, become cre creative when it comes to enlargement. So now they are talking about 27 plus six and the six being more economic integrated and in you know, security related issues, but not full integration. And this is wrong. What we need is full political integration because the EU is not just us having access to structural funds. It's not about the money and it shouldn't be about, you know, being part of the EU just, you know, for the sake of being part of the EU. It's about completing a transformation we started decades ago, which is democratization, the process of democratization of the region. Uh, what happened here is that my entire life and for as long as Kosovo existed, uh, it has been shaped to fit into the EU. Uh, it's it's been in a way uh, uh, a shape to fit the union. So uh, everything that has been done in the past decades is because of the overarching goal, which is the EU integration uh, uh, process. Um, as for the, the veto, I mean, as I said, the French veto was a wake up call. I mean, we 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 knew that the enlargement is not going to happen. It was Juncker saying that in 2014 or 15, and it was you know sort of the first actual explicit uh, statement saying that enlargement is not going to take place. But then there was this strategy for Western Balkans, which in a way gave hopes that by 2025 will be part of the EU. But then, of course, we have the member states sort of being reluctant about it. Uh, so. Uh, France vetoed, but at least they came up with a new methodology, which, you know, sort of uh, says that there is still struggle and effort from the EU side to basically work in this process. What bothers me is the fact that now when Bulgaria is blocking North Macedonia, France kind of likes it. Uh, which is, you know, kind of, uh, let's drag feet. And if Bulgaria is now the one to blame and are not going to talk about the Dutch and the French, uh, everything is going to be okay. I mean, France is doing the same with visa liberalization for Kosovo. Uh, and and uh, now with Merkel sort of going out of the scene, uh, I see Macron sort of taking uh, her position and her place uh, in the EU. And I don't know how, uh, how the, the, the Western Balkans is going to look like with the French approach. Yep. So it's, it's, it's a very uncertain, but still hopeful that um, things are going to, to, to change for, uh, uh, for positive. Uh, and the EU Thank is going to understand its, its uh, important role in the, in the Western Balkans. Tonika, thank you. Before I hand over to Irina so that she makes it on time, if uh, Alphonse is okay with that, there have been more uh, comments in the question and answer sections. Yes, of course, we are reminded by the anonymous attendee that if you're in the club, you can enjoy the club goods. If you're outside, it's clear that you cannot do so. It reminds me of an excellent paper Christopher Lord from Arena in Oslo has written at the last CES conference on, on, on goods and integration and disintegration, for those who are interested. And second, we also have a comment from Pierre Mirel, Yes, European Union might have failed, but you know we also see some, and I paraphrase here, authoritarian tendencies in those countries. Now, if I would translate that into my language, well, you guys have failed to clean house, you know, and the European Union doesn't want to invite this mess into its own house. Isn't that fair too? Irina, you're next. Thank you. Uh, well, to be brief, to sum up the management of the of this health crisis on the national front has proved that the political establishment needs to alter the national narrative since one of the leading problems is the one related to the citizens' trust of the sta in state institutions. It has been steadily eroding over the past three decades, blunted by overwhelming doubt in the legal system, inequality, human rights abuses, leveled by uh, uh, high level and all encompassing corruption and topped by responsible party lists that aim to instate patronage system in the very core of the government and the policy making. And the COVID-19 crisis proved that uh, much more needs to be done in relation to the building of democracy and democratic institutions, rule of law, respect of human rights and so forth. EU and NATO accessions are a paramount uh, importance to North Macedonia and of course to the region because of the fundamental requirements to the process related to the country's improvement in, uh, in this domain. 
The COVID-19 outbreak demonstrated that the home public was evidently in need of more uh, educative assistance along with the medical help in order to contain the outbreak and raise up to new normality in every sense possible. So education, raising awareness, building on uh, individual responsibility are key to the progress of Macedonian society, even despite of the pandemic. And this is where uh, the partners of North Macedonia and the allies of North Macedonia need to be more engaged and more invested. On the external front, um, uh, and particularly North Macedonia and EU relations, the crisis illustrated that interdependence is key uh, to progress and achieving common goals. So EU solidarity um, uh, must involve, evolve and encompass its uh, longstanding partners, uh, which are the current uh, uh, aspirants for membership and impending allies. The EU also must recognize the need to extend the level of support needed to countries such as North Macedonia, make use of its soft power in order to balance the incentives and the obligations for candidate countries, and mend the initial perception of scarce and overdue EU solidarity. And finally, the COVID-19 crisis has set the stage where we all became aware that the gain and the pain should be shared jointly uh, in partnership. The Bulgarian demands um, and the Bulgarian veto or blockage, if you prefer, cannot be justified by the membership criteria and go beyond the standards of good neighborly relations. So reaching a mutual ground will not be easy and a pleasant endeavor and requires um, a compromise on both sides. And finally, the vital argument that should not be overlooked as is that this is only the beginning of the process since we are at the beginning of the negotiating process, not at the end. And ultimately, without a positive response, I'm afraid that the door is open for any and every possible scenario. And this is partly my answer to the question and the comment uh, pointing out authoritarianism on the borders of the EU. Let's not forget that 18 years have passed since the EU made the original promise of membership to the six Western Balkan countries at the Thessaloniki summit. And now 18 years later, the maturity of the policy seems to be aged enough to be implemented. Further stalling of the process will of course affect EU itself, as well by uh, making its leverage lose its edge and eventually by, by uh, making the Western, uh, the, the uh, Europeanization of the Western Balkans slow down or stop, which is of course an unwelcome scenario for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina. Irina, we understand if you have to run, then please just, just, just run. Uh, I already thank you now. Uh, thanks for your contribution. I would uh, then have uh, the last word for Alphonse, please, before I wrap up. Uh, thank you. Um, to me, this is really kind of a combination of uh, several things. Um, uh, it's the mismatch between expectation and reality. And in, in some ways, uh, we are locally to be blamed for expecting probably a little too much from the EU, sort of expected them to be the mediator in every political crisis at home, for them to be able to help us overcome all of these issues. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be waiting for the EU to um, help us improve the quality and the standards of our education, cleaning our streets, taking care of the water quality and, and electricity and so on. Um, and this, in this regard, um, this really comes into play where we expect the EU sort of to, to be the representation or the mirror of the better self. We are really disappointed with local politicians. And what we see in the EU is sort of the, the better version or what we could be if we work harder. So in that regard, um, having that door shut is really disappointing. And it's, it only benefits the forces that the EU actually doesn't want to, to benefit, such as authoritarian tendencies, the strong leaders, the uh, third party interference, and so on. Um, you see the likes of Raman uh, vindicating themselves from all the responsibility uh, for the lack of progress in the integration front. And it's, he's, not, uh, he's not fully wrong in that regard because he said, okay, here are the criteria, I fulfilled it. You said we fulfilled it. Here we are now. And uh, all of a sudden, it's an extra issue that's come up. But nonetheless, 
it, it really should be emphasized and we should come back to reforms be necessary for the benefit of the local people. We need more uh, accountable governments. We need more transparent governments. We need more democratization, not because the EU asked, but because it's in the benefit of the local people. We want our countries to progress. We're not happy with the status and we should be more demanding of the local leaders. And in this regard, the countries and the governments itself shouldn't stop by doing the bare minimum, but they, uh, they should do more than is expected to be in a better position to negotiate and say, here we are. And uh, if you're willing to take us, um, lend us a hand. Thank you so much, uh, Alphonse. Thank you, all of you. We are one minute before we uh, have the end, reached the end of our discussion here. I thank you very much uh, for your insights that you provided for all of us. I thank all of the audience for having the patience to listen to us and to your questions. If I paraphrase some of the Q&As too much, I apologize for that. Maybe this was for the sake of discussion. Now, before we really wrap it up, I just want to remind everyone that uh, the event has been recorded and uh, will be uploaded to the YouTube channel of TAPSA. Now, all that remains for me to do is thank you again. I wish you a wonderful and hopefully healthy summer. And I'm looking forward already to in around a year when we have for the next issue, which will deal with the member states and their relations to Russia, when we have the next discussion and I duly hope that we will not sit here and then say, well, the European Union has failed and Russia has swooped in. Uh, I wish you all the best and thank you for your attendance and kind regards from Vienna. <laughs>